You guys, I am so excited to introduce you to the next person who's going to be teaching this class. This is my dear friend, Kelsey Ramage. And if, for those of you who don't already know her or know some of her work, she and I go way back. Um, and she started something called Trash Tiki many, many years ago after being the winner of the Tahona Society. Uh, and that year, she won globally, so the whole thing, Kelsey took it, and that year the prize was to become an Altos ambassador globally, and you could pick four countries that you wanted to go to as an ambassador. Dope prize, but in and of itself. But what Kelsey decided to do with that was start Trash Tiki. And so they were using these flights that she had all over the world, and she would pop up in these places that she had chosen, but then they would also take like um, layovers in various countries within those flights and do pop-ups there. And Trash Tiki really started as a way for them to go in and say, hey, you're throwing a lot of stuff away that you can use. Let me have a look at your trash, and I'm going to make cocktails out of it. So one example would be that she'd go to a place that serves a lot of avocados, They'd have all the avocado pits in the trash. They would take those out, clean them up, and make orgeat out of it. Um, she has a number of other ways of working with cocktails and what you would normally think of as trash and putting it into a perspective on something that you could continually reuse. Um, she's also a queen of fermentation, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And fermented liquids are such a great um, substitute for citrus or things that uh, cause a lot of strain on the environment when you're using them when they're out of season. Uh, so she's going to teach us a lot about that today. Um, she Now Trash Tiki has become Trash Collective. Collective, and she is the lead consultant and educator for a Trash Collective, and it is really my honor to invite her here today. She's a wonderful speaker, and I think you're going to really enjoy hearing what she has to say today. Kelsey. Uh, thank you, Amanda. That was such a lovely introduction. Um, I just want to thank Another Round, Another Rally for bringing me out here and um, getting to give you some of this information that I've been developing over the last number of years. And another big thank you to Pruno Ricard. Um, I've worked with him for many, many years. Um, and most recently is the last like two, maybe three years, maybe four years now. Uh, it was pandemic. We don't know, we don't know what time is. Um, as their uh, global sustainability ambassador. So um, through a lot of their support, I have had a real big opportunity to kind of amplify the things that I talk about and, you know, not just have a one small company, but even to even further than that to kind of create this global community of people that are all backing sustainability in different ways. Um, I'm going to do this. Pop this open so I have some speaker notes. Yeah. Um, in front of you, in front of you right now, you've got two different fermentations. Did anybody not get a sample of the fermentation? If you just raise your hand, but one, two, just a couple more. Um, she's going to come around and pour you a little sample of those. So just hold off on those. I'm going to explain them a little bit more in depth. Uh, oh, I'm going backwards. There. <laughs> uh, technology. How many of these talks have I done and still not been able to figure it out? Um, so today we're going to be looking at three major types of fermentation. Um, I've been experimenting with fermentation basically since we started the Trash Collective back in 2016. Um, I've made a number of mistakes and I want to show you some of those mistakes so you don't make them yourselves or hopefully you know you do and you can learn from them. Um, I think fermentation is you know, something that's becoming something of a trend. Um, but I think if we look back at the history of fermentation, we can really like learn from some of the ancestral ways of making food and um, making things shelf stable um, that we can use in our bars. These are really functional things that we can extend, not only extend the shelf life of things, but look to more locally produced uh, fruits and vegetables that we can start using in cocktails and move away from the broken food system that we have that I'll get into in just a second. Um, so the three major fer fermentations we're going to look at today is like a vinegar fermentation, we're going to look at a, like a classic aerobic fruit wine, and then we're going to look at more of like a lacto-fermentation uh, kvass sort of situation. Um, and I think with the basis of those three different types, you can really ferment anything you like. So you can kind of take these tools and just apply it to whatever flavor um, 
you want to have in the cocktail, and I'm gonna just give you the tools that you need um, to get the flavor at the end that you're thinking of, as opposed to just kind of, you know, fermenting stuff and seeing where it goes. <laughs> oh, I keep doing this. Um, so it's just kind of a, a run of day. Um, I'm gonna go into a little bit about me. Amanda gave a really lovely background, but I'm gonna show you kind of three different ways that I have had to make drinks in the past and how sustainability um, feeds into them. Um, we're gonna look at wild versus controlled fermentation and kind of the outcomes and control factors that go into that. Um, we're gonna try not to kill anybody. Um, so I'm gonna give you some safety measures to kind of help you get through that first kind of like hurdle of trial and error. Um, and then we'll look at those three basic ferments. We'll get to taste some stuff. Um, and then I'm gonna give you some resources. Inside those uh, little bags that you have today um, are two books by some of, um, some of the most uh, prolific authors, one about fermentation and one about uh, circular systems in general. Uh, it's called Cradle to Cradle and it kind of was one of the pivotal books that sort of changed the way that I think about any thing that is produced in our world right now as we know it from glassware to clothing to, um, to products in general. Um, and then we'll get to finish with a little cocktail. So those of you who are imbibing, it's a little low ABV, ABV spritz that'll be just kind of a nice way to wrap things up. Um, okay, so I started, I, I guess, I mean, I started my career before the Lion Group. Um, I was a sommelier and uh, running restaurants and that was kind of my background and then I decided that I really wanted to get into cocktails so I went and worked for the Lion Group in London um, and this is where I kind of really started learning about cocktails and learning about how to use the things that are already available to you anytime we did any kind of menu development um, we wanted to look at using what we already have, and this was because we were in a hotel kind of scenario where you want your cost of goods to be as low as possible. So that's where that kind of started. And we started for, um, working with fermentations that were based off of pineapple, so like tapache stuff. With the Lion Group, I, I find this is like very high creative, so you have a lot of people, you have the kind of um, budgets for a, a higher, um, uh, labor cost. Um, so we had um, the ability to be super creative and use kind of whatever we wanted, um, which is very, very stark contrast to uh, the Trash Collective, which used everything sustainability first. Um, so we were looking at, you know, what restaurants were throwing out. I think at the time we were so... Um, you know, Trash Collective is an online recipe base, so if you ever want any of my recipes, you can go to thetrashcollective.com and pull them, pull them off of there and find inspiration. It's kind of just meant to be this like free resource for anyone to access at any time. You can pull it up from your phone and just kind of like, you know, groove off of that. Um, we did find a problem though when we went on tour, and that was that all of our recipes were using, um, you know, citrus and pineapple and kind of some of these like very regular cocktail bar items that can be found anywhere in the world. The problem is that they're not grown anywhere in the world. So what we've sort of started talking about since then, since about um, the change of the rebranding, we dropped Tiki for um, cultural appropriation reasons, but also wanted to build the Trash Collective into something that talked about not just tropical style drinks, uh, but any kind of style drinks. And then um, more over top of recipes, we were also talking about water wastage, energy usage, um, single use plastic usage, recycling, et cetera, and kind of like a whole restaurant system. Um, with the Trash Collective, you we had to be very creative because our um, the things that were wasted were commonly the same thing. So having to come up with new drinks constantly on the same like three or four items uh, was a completely different transformation than say the Lion Group where we get access to basically anything. Um, Black Lagoon is my goth metal Halloween pop-up that I do with my partner, Aaron Hayes. Um, these drinks have to be um, available uh, North America wide. Actually, we have um, a location in Guadalajara and also in Paris, France, and all over Canada. Um, these have to be ingredients that are readily available and very low prep. So it's a completely different transformation, again, from the Trash Collective. And weaving sustainability into all of these different you know, types of outlets is, is a challenge. 
Um, and then the consulting arm of, of Trash Collective is basically you're at the whim of, you know, whatever the um, your client wants. So if they want a super sustainable sort of menu, but they're um, maybe in a, in a large like hotel group type of setting, you kind of have this barrier of no prep. So then you have to kind of look at, you know, what spirits can support a sustainable program? How can I support, you know, smaller producers with a bigger buyer? So you kind of have to think um, completely differently than I, than I think of with like Black Lagoon or even the Trash Collective. So um, there's a lot of different ways of, and a, lif a lot of different backgrounds. So I, I, you know, if you're working for a larger company or you're working with a super small, you know, know, um, craft cocktail bar. Um, I've mostly done it all. So I'm, I'm really open to like um, all of your questions today. I'm encouraging you to, you know, raise your hand as I'm going through things. And if I, you know, I'm going to address it later, I'll just let you know. But um, I really want this to be like a conversation. And if you're having any struggles, um, I want to hear about them uh, kind of towards the end. So has anyone here messed around with fermentation in their, in their bar situations? A couple? Cool, yay. Okay, I love this. Has anybody screwed any of them up? There we go, every single person, I love that, okay. <laughs> um, so most of you, a lot of you put, raised your hands, which is, which is amazing. Um, I wanna talk about a little bit, kind of defunc debunking the fear around um, fermentation and the idea that microbes exist on everything. So human beings have been fermenting, um, there's archeological evidence that we've been fermenting for 110, what is it? 10,000 years ago. So they found evidence on like little clay pots that was like a beer yeast that was, that was a remnant. So we've been doing this for, for ages. And if we think about our food systems right now, we are really the first generation that has the avail availability of global food. Um, if I even think of like where my grandma got their food, um, or even my parents where they lived, I grew up in a very small town. So did my uh, so did my parents. Um, they had to you know work within seasonality. And in Canada, you know, I know that I'm speaking to a lot of you from New York. It's very similar. Um, you have a growing season of maybe six to eight months, and some of the growing seasons for certain things like berries are even like six weeks. So you have to employ. Um, methods of flavor stabilization and, um, you know, either fermenting or canning something so you can be, use, it, e use it either for a menu turn or an entire season, depending entirely what your storage situation looks like. Um, but all life, essentially, is covered in microorganisms. At any given time on our human body, uh, microorganisms outnumber our cells uh, 10 to 1. And this applies to any kind of food. So yogurts, even carrots fresh out of the ground, the ground itself, everything is covered in microorganisms. So what we're doing with fermentation is creating conditions where the microbes that we want to grow and we want to change the flavor of our food um, are given an opportunity to thrive. And then the the microbes that we don't necessarily need the flavor of or are dangerous for ourselves, we're creating an env environment where they de die off um, and it's not an ideal situation for them. So that the fermentation itself is exactly what you want it to be. Does that make sense? I keep doing this. <laughs> um, so I divide fermentations into two major types. There's aerobic and anaerobic, which we'll get into in a second. Um, but the first kind of question you want to ask yourself is whether or not you want this a wild or a controlled fermentation. Personally, when I started fermenting things, it was a controlled fermentation. I think the first one I did was wild, and I was like, I'm not going to do that again until I've learned the, uh, the basics here. Um, a wild fermentation is amazing. It's a natural fermentation where you can use the microbes that exist in the air to create um, a yeast system that starts the thing fermenting. Um, some examples of this is, are like kombucha, where you don't use a SCOBY to start. So if you leave tea out in a very controlled area covered, um, it'll start to get that scum on the top. That eventually becomes a SCOBY. So that's kind of like the starter there. Um, 
often in natty wine where they're just leaving like um, fruit to ferment naturally. They're using the yeast uh, that exist in the air. Um, but I want you to kind of think of something, you know, the air that exists in like a bar basement is not going to be the same that exists, you know, on a beautiful wi winery in the French countryside. Um, so your environment has a huge, huge impact on a natural fermentation. Um, Controlled, this is where I like starting. So you're buying a yeast uh, that has been cultivated. So something like, uh, I think it's an EV118C. Uh, you can get on Amazon, which is great. It's a little like champagne yeast. You can, um, you can use it from a dried form. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. You can activate it yourself. You can take it with you anywhere. Um, this is kind of like the number one yeast that I use if I'm starting like a wine fermentation. Um, so any kind of wine, bread, beer, yeast that you can buy off the shelf, use the instructions for, and then create this fermentation. What that's gonna do is create a faster fermentation. So something's gonna start going uh, with, you've already created a, an ideal situation for whatever you're fermenting by adding the yeast, because that's gonna start creating its own microbes very, very quickly versus um, a wild fermentation, which is going to take a little bit more time to create its own positive mi microbes, and that's where you kind of have that danger area in the start, sometimes. Um, some of the positive things about a wild fermentation, though, it is so exciting because you never really know what exactly is going to happen. So you might get these like wonderful, you know, apricotty orange notes. It might over ferment into like a Belgian beer kind of yeasty situation. Um, wild fermentations are great for that. And as your, you know, seasons change, if you wanted like, as your climate changes even, you're going to get a different result. Um, which is very, very interesting and cool to see. And what I encourage people to do is have a journal out, have the date on it, kind of make a note of your climate, if it's, if it's humid or hot that day, and, and just like some of the results of what you're tasting. So you can kind of, you know, see how it changes and, and just have a, a reference back that's like super fascinating. Um, like I said, the controlled one, um, it, it gets the fermentation going faster. Um, but it's also like this really interesting control factor, whereas if you're using like um, a Kevic yeast, it's gonna get the fermentation going a lot quicker and um, almost create this like lacto soft kind of creamy situation in your final fermentation, which is like usually within 24 hours um, versus something like a wine yeast um, or even a bread yeast. I've used like, uh, stale bread to start a fermentation, which is probably more of a wild situation, but maybe somewhere in the middle. Um, but you can use uh, wine yeast and kind of swap out the different ones, whether you want like a champagne sort of style yeast, if you want like a Chardonnay style yeast, they're all going to yield different results. And again, you can go back to your kind of notebook and, and figure out which one you really want um, to create your end result, whatever thing that you have in your head that it will be. Um, and guarantee you it will always be different from that. <laughs> um, okay, so this is what I like calling microbial warfare. Once you've decided like which fruit, fruit you want to ferment, if you're doing it aerobically or anaerobically, which we'll get into in a second, I'm going to talk right now about an uh, aerobic uh, fermentation and what exactly. Um, we're going to use kombucha as the example, but this also applies to any kind of wine or beer fermentation. Um, so SCOBY is a symbiotic community of bacteria in yeast. Basically what you're doing by putting the SCOBY at the top, which is a natural protector, you know how, has anyone, most people have seen a SCOBY, right? Like pancake looking weird thing that grows on top of tea. Um, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> once you have that in there, you, you're adding a little bit of sugar. The yeast from the SCOBY starts eating the sugar. It, um, gives out CO2 and ethanol. The CO2 is going out in the, the atmosphere alongside acetic um, uh, vinegar. Um, and that alone in the air directly above the SCOBY, if you ever get like close and you smell it, it smells like you know, vinegar and not very nice. Um, but that's creating a, a community uh, that negative microbes that we don't want to perpetuate um, are going to actually die. So it, it creates its own little community in there. Um, 
the ethanol in the liquid uh, is toxic to many microbes that we don't want in there, but actually feeds the vinegar. So vinegars like, or sorry, feeds the bacteria. Bacteria likes the, um, the ethanol and then the maltose and the sugar and gives away um, lactic and acetic acid, which is another thing that, that prevents the negative microbes from growing. So you kind of have this whole little community um, going on inside any fermentation, which is super cool. Um, if you want to go deeper on wild versus controlled, these are some of the most amazing people that you could, you know, ever have the opportunity of listening to. So Ariel Johnson, um, she does a podcast on flavor and fermentation. She is a flavor scientist. She helped write the Noma Food Lab book. Um, she's also a food writer for the LA Times. She is Wonderful. If you just like follow her Instagram, um, she has a couple of YouTube videos out. Um, I think she's she approaches flavor and shelf stability from a very interesting food background. Um, Sebastian Biro and David Cote are both uh, Canadians, and they go very much into lacto fermentation. If you want to get into that, um, both of their Instagrams are super in interesting, um, and this is kind of like. Uh, very simple kind of introduction into lacto-fermentation, but it's very interesting. Um, Sandor Katz, uh, you have the book inside, um, inside those bags. This is, he is like the one, the person to like look to for fermentation. He's done a number of TED Talks, um, all of which are super interesting, and he kind of debunks the, the microbes in a very similar way, um, and he'll apply fermentation mostly to food, but there is definitely things that you can get out of that wonderful book that you have. Um, so that's a big thank you to Perna Ricard and Another Round, Another Rally for providing those. It's my favorite, favorite book. Oh my God. <laughs> um, yeah, so The Art of Fermentation. I do like referencing the Noma um, Food Lab book um, every once in a while. I do find it applies more to food, so I do find that Sandor Katz's book is much more relevant for what we're talking about. Um, and then he also does a book on wild fermentation, which was my first fermentation book, but I would definitely recommend the one that you have first, but that's a very interesting reference for anything that's kind of like unknown and wild. Um, a note on food systems and how, how broken um, our society has become. Um, the Third Plate by Dan Barber is a wonderful book and kind of changed the way I look at food systems in eating. Um, essentially, we have, as a society, um, broken the Midwest. <laughs> um, what happened in, I believe, the 60s was we were planting a lot of the same crops, and it essentially, um, once the harvest was done, we had about a three-foot layer of just basically dust, so it was completely depleted soil that could no longer sustain life um, through generations of um, mon monocultural farming. Um, and it wasn't until this giant dust bowl that picked up in the Midwest hit the White, White House physically that um, North America started doing anything about it. So if you want to learn more about that and about a specific strain of wheat that doesn't have uh, the same depleting root systems, the third plate is an incredible resource and I very highly recommend uh, just picking it up and giving it a read. Um, and then Jane Goodall, who spoke um, much more about food and uh, chimpanzees. Um, her references on food, though, are very, very interesting. Um, this is like, I know she is vegan, um, but she does go into how much food our bodies actually need versus how much the world is producing right now and then wasting, um, which is another part of our broken food system. So if you ever want um, another reference on that, it's a wonderful book, and it's a very easy read. You can kind of feel like her wonderful, like, mothery energy through the words that she's got on that page. So um, I highly recommend that one. Uh, okay, um, so the two fermentations that you have in front of you, one was aerobic, the other was anaerobic. Um, and the decision that I made, um, this is like a very important part of the, the decision-making process. Um, Aerobic fermentations need oxygen-rich conditions to grow and thrive. So things like the strawberry wine, um, that was 
grown in an aerobic condition. The other one is a lacto-ferment. So what I wanted to do was ensure that there was no air uh, that could contaminate um, and or change uh, what I was desiring as the result. Um, how did I come to that decision? Basically any like kind of fruit wine situation, I usually go to a classic wine style fermentation. So it's really simple, fruit, sugar, little water, yeast, um, cover it with an airlock, make sure it's all good and you know, taste it every like three to five days. That's the most simple fermentation. I'm gonna show you the recipe up here in just a sec. The second one, um, I could have probably fermented it with, um, in the wine style. However, the, the pH level of um, any kind of citrus, be it lemon, lime, this is tangerine, anything like that, uh, is a little bit too high. High, low, what, what is, which is the one? Low, okay, great, <laughs> I always get confused. The pH level is usually a little bit too low for a fermentation to really start bubbling and then that's where you get into kind of like a danger area where um, the fermentation takes a while to kick off. Um, so to balance out that pH level using whey, which is just a byproduct of either yogurt and sugar, um, you can bring that, that pH level back up to an area where um, it's, it's more fermentable, so long as you have no air uh, in your fermentation vessel. Um, now you can do this in a mason jar, which I don't really recommend. You can and do it in a vac seal bag so long as you can get the air out, um, which I know is another single-use plastic. Um, but those are kind of the two, the two major ones. I usually stay away from any kind of like uh, cambro situation um, just because any kind of indentation in the cambro is an opportunity for those microbes to get, to get in and start flourishing. Um, Plastic is actually fine for wine fermentations because the yeast go get going really, really quickly and kind of kill off anything that's going to be inside. Um, but I still do some safety measures. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to equip you with a few uh, tools that I use for um, any kind of fermentation before I even start. Start. Um, Cleaning stuff. Uh, it sounds really complicated, but pota potassium metabisulfate. Ooh, I got it. Um, is a, is a wonderful thing. You can just order it off of Amazon or get it from your local U-Brew. Um, you just make a little slurry in water and rinse any, any type of fermentation vessel, be it glass or plastic, um, and it just kind of kills off anything that might be, any microbe that might be growing on there already and create an environment where you can start fresh um, and create the microbes that you want. Um, gloves, uh, this might seem obvious, but I've seen a lot of people starting fermentations with their bare hands, like I just said, more microbes than cells, right, at a, at a rate of, of 10 to 1. So you really want to make sure that you're covering your hands with gloves, clean ones. Um, vessels. Um, I've never seen... Um, I've never used metal in my in my vessels. Um, the acetic acid within like something like a kombucha can actually um, deteriorate stainless at a, a rate faster than the fermentation. So I would just stay away from anything that contains metal. It's also going to kill a scoby for sure. Um, so anything that's like a kombucha style fermentation, I would use glass. Um, whereas with a beer or wine um, type of fermentation, you can use a fermentation vat with an airlock on the top. Uh, very simple, very cheap equipment. Um, the other th wonderful thing about fermentation is that adding that little bit of water to it, um, you're going to help the fermentation a little bit, but it's also water is almost free. <laughs> Um, and then your space. So I really want you to consider, you know, fermenting in a basement is totally fine so long as you're covering the thing and making sure that, like, you know, no outside um, microbes can get, can get in. So whether that's an airlock or, like, a completely sealed container, um, your, even your feet, you know, dragging past as you're walking past a fermentation, you want to make sure that it's off the floor because your feet kick up in invisible dust that just goes into the ecosystem and then once it's there, it's there and you kind of don't want to do everything possible to, to sort of avoid that. So low traffic area, pretty low light. Um, you want somewhere that's like mostly temperature controlled so it never really drops more than, you know, 10 degrees uh, if that's entirely possible. So usually somewhere um, subterranean. Um, yeah, I think that's, does anybody have any questions about that? Move on. Um, so these are a few of the, the 
contaminants that are out there. Um, botulism is something that occurs on low acid canned food, grows in anaerobic conditions. It is also, um, I think, colorless and flavorless. Um, so you're really gonna wanna make sure that you're washing everything down with potassium metabisulfate. Salmonella doesn't occur as much, but just making sure you're washing everything is basically the, the, the take all from this. Um, has anybody ever seen eels in their kombucha? Lucky you. <laughs> They're disgusting. Um, <laughs> uh, eels actually thrive, thrive off of some of the uh, microbes that exist in acetic acid, um, and they can continue to thrive in an acetic acid condition. Um, so the only way to like really make sure that they don't happen is making sure your stuff is clean before you start, and then making sure the top is covered and is in a low traffic area. Um, Otherwise, if external microbes get in that, that can feed them, they can exist in that environment and they're only, only gonna get worse. So the only thing you can do is throw the whole lot away and make sure, make damn sure that you like uh, clean your vessel afterwards um, multiple times. <laughs> uh, yeah, these are awful. I've, I've seen them before. Um, okay, so we're gonna go into three different types of uh, basic ferments. Um, and this is where you guys can try them. Um, I'm going to give you some base recipes and encourage you to go away and um, if you do run into problems or you just have questions, um, please do reach out to me. I'm on Instagram at Kelsey Ramage or at uh, The Trash Collective. Um, I'm here and I'm like, I want to support this community so I'd really encourage you all to reach out. Um, Okay, this is a really basic recipe for uh, how I start any kind of wine, including the one uh, that you have in front of you that's a strawberry wine. Basically, we took strawberries, uh, blended them, and then instead of the water, I used a white peony tea to kind of give it a botanical uh, kind of vibe or backbone. Um, so usually the sugar content will be about 20% of your total, um, your total volume with water and fruit. In this recipe specifically, I reduced the amount of water because I'm um, just dealing with uh, the, the, the ferment was put on here while I was in LA. So essentially I couldn't try the strawberries, so I dropped down the water content a little bit to ensure that we had like a real like bright strawberry flavor. Um, and then basically what happened was that it fermented a lot quicker than, um, than I was used to. Uh, I thought it would ferment in about five days. It fermented in four. So what we've got now is this like super Belgian beery kind of yeasty thing that uh, that um, that was the outcome that wasn't in my main plan, but still worked out in the cocktail, which we'll try later. Um, so I think arresting fermentation at a specific point is very important, um, just to be able to control, you know, the fruit content of the of the final product versus like some something super yeasty and 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 weird. Yes. Yeah. So if if it ever does go to this point, what you can do is just like as long as it's not at the vinegar point, which I think another day we'd be too late. You can just add um, sugar back in. Um, and it'll start like bubbling away. It does increase the alcohol content when you do that. But um, another thing that you can do is this, because it's so alive and at that like bubbly belgian -y beer stage, you can use this as a mother for any kind of other ferment. If you want to like control your yeast maybe in like a wild ferment um, and you really like the outcome of one, keep a cup of it um, or like a little vat of it and you can just dump that into your next fermentation to create the same conditions. Um, another thing that you can do, I'll get to you right after. Um, another thing that you can do is once you've kind of racked off the fruit, um, I recommend coffee filtering. You can take the remnants of that coffee filter, which is the yeast, dehydrate it and use it in the next season because that's kind of a stabilized um, yeast. How do you arrest? We're going to get to that right at the end. <laughs> Um, Lacto-fermentation. So this is kind of how I figured out how to um, ferment uh, tangerine juice. Um, it was kind of an experiment when we were figuring out what to do with your leftover lemon or lime juice after, you know, a service. You always have like, I don't know, a liter, half a liter, whatever it is. Um, me neither. <laughs> Um, uh, so we needed to figure out a way that we could turn it into a, um, a, a thing that was useful. And what we were finding when juice is like a day or two old um, is that the 
pH level drops. So you get this like cloyingly acidic thing that's not good for daiquiri. So what could we use to bring that pH level back up to a level where it is good in daiquiris? Or it can be made into an entirely different drink, depending on how this fermentation was going to land, um, which I, I'll be honest, I was unsure it was going to work at all. Um, anyway, so I ended up uh, lobbing some whey. I used like a typical uh, kvass like style recipe, a little bit of salt, a little bit of sugar. Um, and in three days, I had like little balloon bombs of uh, tangerine ferment. Um, so some of the things to kind of look out for if, in like a vegetable ferment, you're going to see like the water go from clear to maybe a little bit cloudy. Um, fruit or veg will like lose its like vibrancy. Um, anything like really discolored that, that is, you know, away from what the fruit might be, pink, black, anything like that, you're just going to want to toss the whole thing. Um, and then usually it needs to be fully fi finished fermenting. And fortunately with liquids, they will tell you. Um, I think with this tangerine ferment, it was like flat for two days and then all of a sudden, you know, four hours before I was supposed to get on a plane, it like turned into these little balloons. So I'm very happy that it made the journey um, <laughs> and you guys can all try it. Um, but yeah, give it a try. It's like this, uh, you're gonna find that it's like, it's gone away from the tangerine in there. It's a little bit softer. Um, and then it's kind of just like, it's not as cloyingly acidic. Um, so it's kind of useful way to use your excess citrus juice. Um, kombucha, this is like a very basic sort of kombucha recipe as a good like kind of rule of thirds. Uh -huh. um, we're, I use 20% sugar in any kind of fermentation. The one that I brought with me today um, is a June scoby. So it um, specifically thrives with raw honey and uh, green tea, which is different from a regular scoby. Um, it also is termed the champagne of kombucha because it the fizz that it creates is like a really fine bubble uh lovely fizz um so i'm excited for you to try that it's just not fully fermented um so we're going to do a little raffle at the end and i'm going to give away a scoby to whoever wants to go try one. this guy is very much alive so if you whoever wants a scoby pay attention <laughs> um so your control factors these are all of the things that are going to go into um, how you control the end product of your ferment. Uh, one of them is time. Um, especially with something new or unfamiliar, you're going to want to keep track of how long uh, it ferments. And I've put on the same fermentation in Ontario, uh, LA, Mexico, and Miami. And I'm telling you that the fermentation time was different in all of those different climates because you have um, your oxygen levels that are different in sea, from sea level to like top of a mountain in Argentina, which is where I put on the last ferment and took 10 days. Um, but you also have like air pressure uh, differences that's gonna affect in, in the amount of time. So you just kind of want to keep those factors in the back of your mind as you're controlling the amount of time. And if you want more of like a residual sugar uh, left, you're going to want to arrest the fermentation before the sugar is gone. So when it's right at that point that you're like, ooh, this would be good in a cocktail, we're going to arrest the fermentation. If you want to not use citrus in your cocktails and you want to create more of a, you still want the flavor of like strawberry or whatever it is that you're putting in there. Um, but you don't want to use citrus, you want to kind of get rid of that like sweetness, you're just going to want to leave it on a little bit longer. And the longer you leave it on, the more yeasty and weird it's going to taste. So it's going to get further and further away from that original fruit. Whereas if you leave a little residual sugar, you're going to have that like lovely pop of fruit that you get in like, a, you know, a, a Riesling or something. Um, and then there's kind of the third stage, that once it's fully fermented, which for reference, if you're tasting the strawberry wine right now, that is fully fermented. Um, any further than that, like if in 24 hours, that's gonna become our acetic kind of vinegar uh, situation. Um, I love fermenting. If I've accidentally fermented something into a vinegar, um, I'll just like rack it off and refrigerate it and you can use that as a replacement for citrus, not in the same quantity. You don't wanna be putting like three quarters of an ounce of vinegar in anything, but uh, usually what I do is, is fill a dropper bottle um, right beside you know your orange bitters, your Angostura bitters and a little dropper bottle of like saline and then vinegar um, and it can just like, it works the same way as citrus does in like a pie. It'll just like bring out the fruit of, of anything that you're like, 
putting in with a fruit base in your cocktail. So it's just kind of this like nice little tool that I think more people should be using. Um, temperature and rel relative humidity. Um, and I'm saying a lot of big words today. <laughs> I feel like I should have done a little vocal warm up. Um, Temperature and relative humidity are, the higher that those are, the quicker you're gonna have a fermentation. And there is a level, you know, at like 24, 25 degrees. Yes. Sorry. Oh, sorry. So I wanted to ask you, with these vinegars that generate sort of out of your fermentations, is the strength of that vinegar similar to a commercial vinegar or are they more or less intense? Do you need to, like just in terms of gauging how you would use it? Yeah, I think uh, they're a little bit less intense. Um, if you think of like an apple cider vinegar being like that's kind of like where that's going to exist um, as opposed to like a white distilled vinegar that's going to be super like cloying, these are going to be a little bit softer. Yeah. Um, yeah, so your temperature and, and rel relative humidity, you never really, I don't know what 25 degrees is in, I'm going to have to learn this. I think it's around 70. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, it's around 70. You're never going to want it to get more than that because then you're creating, like I said in the beginning, you're creating a sort of a, um, a, a, a community that negative microbes are going to want to uh, reproduce. Um, so always want to keep it around 70. I'm going to double check that fact at the end, but 25 degrees Celsius. Um, your sugar, obviously, it makes a difference in the type of syrup that you're creating, but your sugar is actually a really important part of fermentation. There are only certain um, yeasts that can consume honey. Um, one of them is a jeune, um, but you're going to have to research if you're really wanting to use honey in a fermentation. Make sure the yeast can actually break it down because it does create, it does, uh, honey basically does this. It has like cells that are really, really tightly linked and it's hard for yeast to then get in there and kind of break them down. So you want to make sure that you have a yeast that likes honey. Um, but beyond that, you know, experiment. Try with like a demerara sugar. Try it with like a cane sugar. Try it with like, you know, a multitude of different things and it's always going to yield a different sort of... Um, I find that demerara gives this really like lovely malty sort of finish on things. So um, play with it and have fun. Um, air, obviously, you're going to want to think about your air quality in, within the, the growing environment, um, but also whether or not you want an aerobic or anaerobic uh, fermentation. And usually if you're starting something with a uh, yeast, like a beer or wine yeast, it's going to tell you right on the package what, what you need to do. Um, if you're starting like any type of lacto-fermentation, you want that anaerobic. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and then, your, yeah, your pH level, which I touched on a lot. Um, whenever you're thinking of your base fruit, anything like a berry or, you know, something that's, like, not super acidic, raspberries might be, like, a question on that, on that scale. So you might want to, like, test out, you know, a raspberry fermentation that's a lacto and a, la a raspberry fermentation that's a wine fermentation to see where uh, you want things to land because both of them are probably going to be fine. Um, and then your base. Obviously, you want to like look at things that you want to create flavor and, and stabilize and have in your local area and think about, you know, what's accessible, what can farmers that are near me produce, um, and can, is this sustainable for a menu turn? Can you get enough of it to create a cocktail that sustains, you know, six months on the menu? Or is perhaps your whole, that we were talking about earlier, um, Maybe you do need to 86 that cocktail uh, just in order to teach people that things aren't available year round, you know, and just say this is available during the growing season. We made, you know, 20 liters of wine with it and that got us through for four months. So, you know, it, it needs to be, I think there needs to be a growing, a, a bigger conversation around how often and where from we get our, our base uh, things. But then you, once you've got your wine, you can like look at making vermouths. You can look at making them sparkling. Like there's a whole host of, you know, doors that open once you've you've figured out how to ferment things. Um, okay, we're gonna get into arresting fermentation. Um, I think we're. I, how am I doing on time? In another. Great. Okay. Awesome. Um, so once you've fermented something to the desired state of your outcome, you want to like stop it. Um, and, and f stop it from changing. Basically, you're going to want to get the yeast out of the liquid as quickly as possible. So you're gonna strain out your fruit pulp, obviously, um, but then you're gonna want either a super bag or a very fine coffee filter to get out 
the yeast. Um, and that's gonna be any like cloudy bits in, in the bottom. As soon as you take that from like room temperature, you've, you've strained it all out through a coffee filter, you put it in the fridge, you're gonna find that because of that um, cold temperature, the yeast inside the liquid that you couldn't see before is gonna die and fall to the bottom. So in another 24 hours, you're gonna wanna coffee filter that again. Um, if you are batching this into a cocktail, um, I would recommend adding the alcohol at this point because um, that's going to further kill off any uh, yeast that's growing. The yeast is wonderful and it like um, multiplies very quickly, but you do want to get it out of there. Um, and like I said before, once you've like strained it all out, dehydrate it, use it for the next season, package it up. It's a really awesome little thing that you can do. Um, I think I've touched on, yeah, residual sugar just means that you've got a little bit of sweetness added to the end. These are the most difficult to arrest the fermentation of, so you're really going to want to make sure that you chill it for at least 24 hours um, and then, like, never really take it out of the fridge. Uh, double coffee, filter it, and out, add alcohol. You're just going to want to do all the things you possibly can uh, to kind of arrest that fermentation. Um, a lot of people uh, have asked me if um, freezing something is a good option. Um, freezing definitely kills off all the yeast, but it's also going to take away all of those yummy little like funky natty wine kind of notes and, and, and just kind of leave you with a more flat, um, uh, flat flavor at the end. So for somebody who really loves all of those little microbes and how that tastes, I'd recommend not. But if it's something that you want to experiment with, um, there's no harm in that. Um, yeah, we, we just touched on this. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna like rapid fire through some recipes for y'all and we can like bring out the last uh, cocktail. Sweet, um, while I'm doing this. So this is kind of like just the classic, like how I made this um, tangerine ferment. Um, and if y'all have any questions as I'm going through this, please shoot your hands up. Um, yeah, so like, 20% whey, a little bit of sugar. I love, always add a little bit of salt um, to a lacto-ferment. Um, the number one reason why lacto-ferments fail is that you don't have enough salt, salt content. So you just have that, and it like, tastes good. We all love salt. Um, this is a classic fermentation of uh, the wine yeast. You all want to take a photo of that. It's like very, very simple. It's like package directions on most wine yeasts. Um, but you, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll share it with um, Amanda or you. And yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the Genmaicha kombucha, which I'm going to auction off right now. Um, I have I have a lot of it, and you're welcome to like come up and taste a little bit after when we're doing our little lunch hour thing. Um, but if somebody could tell me the five control factors in any fermentation, um, I will give you a SCOBY. Uh. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Like a pH, air, temperature, uh, time, sugar. Yeah. And, uh, there were six, but I'll give you. I'll give you five. <laughs> Sweet. Um, I also have a lot of scoby back there, so if anybody wants some, I can cut it up. But <laughs> thanks for taking the bait. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, I'm gonna just get briefly touch on this while this uh, while the drink is coming out. Um, I usually use my fermentations um, as a full ounce in anything. Um, usually, if it's like slightly acetic, I'm gonna just kind of draw back. But the typical like cocktail spec, one and a half uh, spirit, half modifier, you know, three quarters citrus and then sugar, does not apply to fermentations because you've got something that has such a wildly variable um, leftover sugar content um, that you're really essentially going to have to adjust, you know, every time that you batch, um, unless you've got a refractometer and you've got things like dialed. Uh, even then, it's always going to change. Um, so, like I said, if something is like at the acetic level, you're gonna to wanna to put it in a dasher. Usually if it's like at a wine level and I've added a little bit of botanicals, think about it as like a vermouth or a white wine or even a sherry. That's kind of like where I approach these things. And it's a really wonderful way of um, making drinks that are low ABV as well. You've got um, you know, a wine 
that you've made yourself that is like between 0.5 and 1% alcohol. So it's a really wonderful, lends itself really, really nicely to a spritz. Um, so I'm gonna close out on that. What you've got in, coming out in front of you right now is a um, little bit of sherry, some bee feeder gin, um, that tan, the, what am I doing? <laughs> Tangerine ones later. Um, white peony and um, strawberry, and then a touch of the tangerine oleo that was made from the skins of the other ferment. And um, yeah, I really hope you enjoyed it. And yes. Um, so like a while ago, I was thinking kind of about sustainability and like the life, like the shelf life of wine and kind of how they start to turn to vinegar. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to like control that process and either like speed it up or like slow it down to get a vinegar that has all the properties of like a Chardonnay or something that's yeah. like on the way out? Uh, I've used, I've used spent wine that's just been open too long and starts to oxidize. I've used that to then um, come back and make like a um, vermouth because essentially you're covering all the oxidative qualities that you don't want with a bunch of botanicals and then fortifying it. The act of fortifying it is gonna like kind of stop that a little bit. Um, if it's already gone to vinegar, it's basically just gone, but you can leave it out and allow it to continue to ferment. I know there's a couple of like commercial um, vinegar companies that actually use spent wine to start their, um, their vinegar. So if you wanted to like, um, you know, put it in a, once it's open, you could just put it in a, like a mason jar and just like cover the top with like cheesecloth or something, or put it in like, you could dump it all into a giant fermentation vat, vat with like an airlock on the top. And that would just continue to turn more and more vinegary until you're happy with it. And then you can like fortify it and chuck it in the fridge and hope for, hope for the best. <laughs> uh, yep. Mm. But it tastes like the base of that red wine vinegar is whatever you're starting wine in. So since we buy nice wine to serve out of glass, when it's been open for a couple of days, we should have the vinegar, but the base taste of it is still the, that nice wine. So it's a little nicer than the same red wine vinegar. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's go you and then you. you. Yeah. Nama, you want to go? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> It's massively difficult. <laughs> um, so the question was with consulting, how do we you know, pretty much get big companies on board with what we're doing? And usually the answer is uh, simplicity of execution and financials. So if I can prove that like uh, having something listed on a cocktail list at a certain um, you know, poor cost is uh, smart and that they can list something as sustainable on their menu. It's, I usually get approached, fortunately, by companies that want to keep this at the backbone of what they're doing um, so that they can basically list it on the menu for their guests. Um, my job is just to make sure that they're following through on the back end and not just saying it on the menu. Um, and usually what I'll do is like research um, spirits that are you know, sustainable at the distillery level because you know really that they are going to be per, um, purchasing most of their syrups, purchasing lemon and lime juice, and they don't have a lot of like back of house prep space to be able to do a lot of these fermentation things or um, unless they're like a massive um, benefit of cost. Um, so getting them to be on board from a distillery level is usually how I approach it. Um, and then you have a wonderful thing where you're like asking a big hotel group to buy a whole bunch of a sustainably produced product. Um, so the footprint of that kind of like balances itself out, even though you might be like, you know, buying syrups. Yeah, that's, that's how I, I usually approach it with big groups where there's no prep. Yeah. I was wondering, what is the uh, ABV on the cocktail? Um, on this one, it's probably 7 to 10%, I would say, maybe a little bit lower than that. 
Yeah, there's about 20 milliliters of Martell in there. Yeah, I think I got confused when I was explaining the drink earlier. There's Martell and Sherry, not beef eater. <laughs> That's the one later. Um, is there any other? Yep. Yeah, I just had um, a quick question, and Nama, you kind of alluded to it and got into it, but before I get to the question, first of all, fantastic presentation. I'm biased, obviously, but I think <laughs> I can speak for everyone in the room. Wealth of knowledge, um, and I was, you know, we were taking notes, and it, that's really fantastic, so thank you. Um, my question is more related to sustainability, specifically. Um, so, you know, you were alluding to it again throughout your presentation, but do you have kind of more concrete examples of, you know, this ferment will have replaced doing X, Y, and Z, or, you know, like you were saying, using, you know, the X amount of, of, of kilos of citrus um, that would have otherwise been thrown out. By creating this ferment, you're able to have this sustainability impact, mm. something, you know, to those lines. Uh, massively, yeah. Um, thank you. That's a great question. I, I think with fermentation, it allows us to reach out to our local farms. I think you know, reusing ingredients within our own restaurants is important. That's where Trash Collective kind of started its education. Um, but we can have a far greater impact and reach if we're using things that are available and we're supporting local farmers and farm communities. Um, monocultural farming, as I briefly touched on earlier, kind of um, decimates acres and acres of land and creates lower biodiversity and an increased need for... Um, pesticides and fertilizers, where if we're supporting smaller farms that are growing a multitude of different things, that naturally alone increases the biodiversity of that area specifically, um, and by nature, um, then reduces the amount of pesticides and fertilizers that they're using, whether or not they've made the decision to become you know, organic or biodynamic or deliberately reduce the amount of um, fertilizers and pesticides that we're using. Um, so I think that's the hugest impact on this. Um, the less that we can re reach for these things that are, that are grown in hotter countries or faraway countries, I think the more that we're supporting our own individual communities in more ways than one, financial, economic, environmental. That answer it? Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I think on the slide you had said to vacuum seal it. Um, so you're also tasting it every day, opening it and resealing it? Uh, yeah. So essentially once it starts, um, it'll tell you. It'll start like creating CO2 and like blowing up the bag. Um, at that point you can burp it is what I say. <laughs> you can like just slit the bag and then like close it and reseal it. Um, I like to leave the liquid probably like three quarters of the way full of the bag so that you can continually reseal the same bag as opposed to like putting it in a new one, mm -hmm. creating a whole another problem. Um, but you can also do it in a mason jar. Um, you just have to make sure that you're burping it like very consistently, otherwise it'll explode. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so again, I not in this space, but um, coming at it from a bit more of the chemistry side, because all of this is happening in a solution and you want to make sure that you reach the ideal pH because mm -hmm. it's acidic. Um, let's say you, you know, are fermenting and it reaches too low um, and it's ruined. How would you go about... Um, increasing the pH, you have to start all the, all over again because then you've used all that water, and so yeah. there's a lot of water use like the other way around. It could be too high, and then it's too alkaline. Yeah, and so how would you go about taking um, like when that? it becomes too acetic, like too vinegar like? Um, you can just use it as a vinegar. It's not all is not lost. You can also use that liquid as a starter for the next um, kombucha. Okay. Um, it's not completely dead. Um, another thing you can do is add sugar to that liquid if it's not too far gone, and it'll kind of come back. Um, I usually I've left things um, and forgotten about them, and then come back and added sugar to it, and it's come right fully back around. It's never going to be, you know that initial sort of like fruity residual sugar kind of situation. It's always going to have like a tiny back note of vinegar, um, but it's not entirely lost. You can use it as a starter. You can add uh, like, you can half the batch 
um, kind of like do two separate one and add it to a complete new batch and you'll have like probably a very similar uh, type of fermentation that you wanted to, you wanted to begin with, if that makes sense. Um, and just a quick follow up to that then, um, in terms of um, pH, what's the, maybe, I don't know if necessarily you know this or someone else, what would you say is like the ideal that you would want to reach so that like it's something to keep in mind so that like all of us here know, okay, when we're playing around with water and we're playing around with the different ingredients, we're going to reach that ideal and it's going to make the, um, the drink that we're making, it's going to make it um, the ideal, um, it's going to make it for, for an ideal taste. Because whether it's wild or whether it's controlled, um, you still want to have some control mm -hmm. um, regardless of whether it is an absence of air or whether it is um, whether it is in an air and in, in a controlled environment with with air yeah um, you do have a science background <laughs> I'm not a chemist I'm not a chemist but I yes I do yeah um, I I love the the I feel like it's a spectrum once you start, you ferment something, you start it over here. Um, as you, you know, add 20% sugar, that sugar content is gradually going to decrease in the acetic. Um, I wish I should have put this on a chart, but the, um, the acetic acid level is going to do this, basically, as your sugar content is coming down. Um, so once you, essentially, you just want to kind of have in the back of your mind what do you want your cocktail to taste like, because that little bit of residual sugar is sometimes really lovely in the finished drink, whereas once it starts becoming a little bit acetic or like almost like a Belgian beer style or like really fizzy, sometimes you'll want to ferment it to that point, or sometimes you want to let it go completely to vinegar so you have this like lovely back fruit note, but you're just using it as a dasher in the cocktail to balance out the acid levels. So it's kind of really up to you. There's no like perfect end point, which is like kind of the fun part of fermentation. You can kind of keep tasting it, keep tasting it, can keep tasting it, and, and really like have this malleable flavor that, um, that you can really use in any way that you like. Yeah. <laughs> exact but vague, right? Uh, yep. Uh, the magic cleaner that it's difficult to pronounce, uh, I have read and been told that uh, like diluted bleach water is a great cleaner. Is there a reason why you uh, prefer this one? Or, and should I not be like writing down mason jars with bleach? Uh, I've never yeah. used bleach, but I mean, it's, it seems to be working for you. Um, I, just, I just use it because it's a neutral, um, yeah pretty neutral. It doesn't add any flavor to anything. You can't smell it. It's just, yeah, it tastes, it smells like water. It doesn't, uh, I don't drink it. Sorry. <laughs> it doesn't taste like water. <laughs> uh, bleach doesn't taste like water. Um, <laughs> and then uh, in terms of air quality, a lot of us are working with, uh, you know, in a basement or a room that you can't really control necessarily, but have you had experience or heard about uh, doing things to control the environment? I'm thinking specific, specifically of like dehumidifiers or yeah, I feel like if you're working in, in a particularly hot, humid climate and you're like, or you're in a dripping basement, dehumidifiers are great. Um, air purifiers, um, you know, if you have like dank, you know, basement situation, those are going to work wonders. Yeah, they're a very good idea. Um, okay. Um, uh, actually, Kind of on, along the same lines of, uh, of what was being said earlier, uh, is there a reason that you go for uh, potassium metabisulfite over sodium metabisulfite? Uh, no, I just have always used potassium metabisulfite, but I'm willing to learn. <laughs> that was, yeah, that, that really, I was just curious if you're in the, already using the metabisulfites for, uh, for decon decontamination, I wanted to know if there was a reason one over the other, but... No, it's just the one that I was recommended at the beginning and just have stuck by because it works. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.